Welcome to the introduction to FME Desktop 2020 training course. My name is Ryan. I'm joined today by Dara and Sam, who will be helping answer questions during the training course. This course will take approximately four hours to complete. I'll be aiming to give you guys a 10 minute break every hour, but I'm gonna to try to roll that into the exercises as well. Uh, so if you're in, if you complete an exercise near the top of an hour and you've got some spare time to run off and grab yourself some coffee, please do so. In order to obtain your certificate of completion for this course, you will need to complete a short quiz. We'll share a link to the quiz at the end of the course. The course manual will be available for you to use even after the Strigo course ends. Something important to note about the quiz, you can retake the quiz as many times as needed. You will need 80% or better to pass the quiz. As you work through the course, keep in mind that the quiz in the manual will not get you the certificate. There is a quiz in the manual itself you can check answers there, but that is just in the manual. However, you should pay special attention to that quiz because when you're taking the certificate of completion exam at the end, you'll find that the questions are very similar. So it's good practice. For the manual itself, there is a link on the lab desktop. You can also go to this http fme.ly itfd2020. That should take you to the manual. I'll also chat out the link to the page which I'm on in just a moment. And the manual will be available once the course complete there is complete. We aren't necessarily recording this specific course, but we do have previous recordings of courses available at safe.com slash training recorded. The goal of this course is to give you a good overview of the capabilities of FME Desktop. Due to the compressed timeline, we cannot cover all of the capabilities of the software, but we will cover the basic functionality, concepts and terminology, as well as where to find additional information. There are roughly six sections to the manual. The introduction provides some useful information if you want to review the course at a later date. Getting started gives an overview of the FME platform and should take us around 20 minutes to complete. Translations, our word for converting between formats, is the longest section and that takes approximately 45 minutes. Transformations, which is changing your data, and workflows, which is slightly more complex procedures, should take around 30 minutes each. Like I said, I'll try to fit in some breaks as we go along, but those will generally be rolled into whatever exercise we're working on near the top of the hour. The wrap up is fairly brief. It'll only take a few minutes at the end of the course. This is a newer training module and covers some of the content from our more extensive FME basics course. We welcome feedback to help us continue to improve training, and I'll send a feedback survey link to you at the end of training today. Now the introduction part of the manual. Chat that out to everyone. For the most part, we just covered that with the learning objectives. So let's go straight actually to getting started.
it's getting started. Uh, by the time we're done this section, we should be able to describe what FME is and what it does, distinguished between the different FME products, desktop, FME server, and FME cloud. Be able to open up a run, uh, open up a workspace and know what a workspace is and run a workspace. So what is FME? FME is the feature manipulation engine, although now we mostly just refer to it as FME. It is the core of all of the Safe Software products. Safe Software began in 1993, helping forestry companies exchange maps with the provincial government. It was technically possible to share the maps back then, but only after hours of manual work. Usually a lot of the information was lost in the process. Nobody is happy about that. So Safe Software created FME to address this problem and has been solving data challenges ever since. Today, FME is the integration platform with the best spatial support in the world, and it continues to expand what is possible by adding support for new data formats and workflows with each release. The creation, manipulation, and analysis of data represent a significant challenge for contemporary organizations. Never before has so much machine-readable data existed, but organizations still struggle to find ways to use this massive information to aid in their decision-making. We define data integration as bringing together data from disparate sources in a unified view to create a data set with both valuable and usable information. It allows organizations with multiple departments, facilities, software, and workflows to bring all their data together. FME allows you to integrate data by reading in files in the manual there it's shown as A and B. Optionally transforming their content here with a transformer tool. We'll be talking about transformers later on and then writing them out. Optionally in a different format or to a different location locally or on the web as shown by C. FME has a centralized model so that adding support for a new format is as simple as plugging it into the core engine. This allows us to support hundreds of file formats. We have customers in many industries, including architecture, engineering and construction, uh, energy, federal government, local government, telecommunications and utilities. In the manual, we have a few examples of companies using FME, organizations using FME, and you can read more about them later by following the links in the manual. Uh, the Vancouver International Airport uses FME to help integrate their floor plans in a computer-aided design format into an indoor mapping format used for navigation in Apple Maps. The Weather Network uses FME to provide real-time weather data from multiple sources, and Tetrad uses FME to help their customers choose sites for new retail locations. FME is a data integration platform comprised of several products. FME Desktop is the desktop publishing application that lets you build data integration workflows. It is the heart of the platform, as all workflows must be built in FME Desktop first. FME Server lets you automate workflows on premises. And FME Cloud is FME Server in a fully hosted AWS, uh, that's Amazon Web Services environment. The first desktop component we'll examine is FME Workbench. Workbench is an application for creating graphic-based solutions to data translation and transformation requirements. It can handle both the geometry 
and the attributes of spatial data. So I'll demonstrate some of that now. So what I want you to do right now, actually, first of all, I'm going to demonstrate this, then I want you to do it. I'm going to go to the lab. It may be asking you for your networks. Do you want this to be discoverable? Click yes. In order to start FME Workbench, you can either click on the Workbench icon in the toolbar at the bottom of the window, or you can go to the Start menu, scroll down a little bit, and here we have FME Desktop. And here we can open up Workbench. Now, the first time that you open up Workbench uh, with a clean install, and all these virtual machines are clean installs, it will take it a few moments to a minute or so to go through all of its startup. Uh, it's got to check out licenses, install some stuff uh, for the new user, so it takes some time. So while we're waiting for that on my machine, I'd like you to go onto your lab, click on the Start menu, go to the FME Desktop option there, and open up Workbench, or go down to the taskbar and open Workbench there. Please go do that now, and I'll give you guys a minute to do that. Okay, so that should at least have Workbench loading up for you. Let's edit out the page I'm currently on in the manual. On that page, there's the major components of FME Workbench. And please go down to that part of the manual. Uh, before using Workbench, there's a number of key windows which are worth being familiar with. When you first open up Workbench, this is what you'll see. We have a Start tab here. On the Start tab, we can create a new blank workspace. We can generate a workspace. This brings up a little dialog that allows us to enter the reader and writer for our workspace. Or we can open up an existing workspace or load up recent workspaces. Also down at the foot of the Start tab, there are some additional resources as well. You can go to the FME community. This is an excellent place to ask, how do I do something type questions? You can access free online training. I think you already know how to do that. Otherwise, you wouldn't be in this course. And you can also live chat with safe software support. This is really handy if you have an issue where FME is not behaving as you would expect. When I click on the main tab, this brings me to the canvas. The canvas is where you define your translations in the form of a flowchart-like setting, where connections between each item represent the flow of data. Above the canvas, we have the menu bar and toolbar. This is many tools for creating, editing, and running the workspaces. The Navigator window is an Explorer-like tool, which displays all of the settings and parameters which can be applied within the translation. Below that, we have a Parameter Editor. To be perfectly honest, uh, I rarely, if ever, use this window. There are other ways to get to the parameters of your readers and writers and transformers, so I rarely use this. 
but it's there by default and it is tabbed. You'll notice down at the bottom here, I have these little separate tabs. It is tabbed with the Transformer Gallery. The Transformer Gallery is a window for the location and selection of all the various transformation tools which are available in FME. At the foot of the workspace, once you run a workspace, there we go. When you run a workspace, up will pop a translation log window. This displays a report on translation results, including errors, warnings, and statistics on the number of features processed. There's also a number of windows which are not turned on by default. If I go up to the view here, view windows, we can see which windows are currently turned on and which ones are not. Uh, one here, which I find, or two here, which I find really helpful, are the history. This is an undo, redo, uh, tree view of what you've done in your workspace. This is not uh, a version control system. Every time you start up Workbench, uh, the history will start fresh. So keep in mind, this is only for your current edit session, but this does allow you to go back uh, to previous versions of your workspace within this edit session. Another really useful window is the help window. Now, as I'm adding these windows, you'll notice that they are all tabbed with my translation log. Uh, the help window is really handy. Anything which I select on the canvas or over here in the transformer gallery will then show up. Uh, in this help window. I can move these windows around as well. If I grab the top of this one here, I can drag it over. I could place that on a different monitor. If I place it above or below other windows, then it will be stacked. I can also place it directly on top of another window. And notice that that window turns blue. When I let go, it's now tabbed with it. Now, because I'm not dealing with a lot of screen real estate here during this course, I tend to keep all of these windows stacked, or sorry, tabbed uh, along the bottom. So now I have my navigator at the bottom, parameter editor. I never use that one, so I'm just going to dismiss it entirely. Transformer gallery, the help, the translation log, and my history. So now let's move on to FME Desktop Components. So let's take a look at the different components of a translation and how they are managed. There are many components that make up an FME translation and they form a sort of hierarchy. The key components in an FME translation are the workspace at the very top of the hierarchy, followed by the readers and writers, the feature types, and the features. The workspace is the top level. In effect, it is the entire definition of a data translation. So when we want to talk about a translation as a whole, we can refer to it as the workspace. Also, we often refer to the .fmw file, which is what a workspace is saved as, as the workspace. The next rung on the ladder is a reader or writer. These are objects or tools inside a translation which either read or write data. Generally, each format of data you wish to read requires a different reader. For example, a workspace might contain a reader to read in an Esri shape file and another reader to read in GE small world data. Similarly, each output format requires a different writer. So you may have, for example, a writer to write an Autodesk AutoCAD file and also a writer to write to Microsoft SQL Server. This is why each workspace can and probably will contain multiple readers and multiple writers. 
In the next level of our hierarchy, objects are called feature types. The usual term would be layer, although some formats use class, category, level, table, sheet, etc. They all mean the same sort of thing. In FME, we call them feature types. The final level of our hierarchy is the smallest unit of data you can have, and we call it a feature. A feature would be an individual piece of line work, or a single polygon, or a single point or annotation feature. As you know, there can and probably will be multiple features in each feature type. So in review, the workspace is at the top of the hierarchy. Within it are the readers and writers. Within those are the feature types, and within those are the features. Within a single workspace, there can be multiple readers and writers, each containing multiple feature types, which of course contain multiple features. In the manual, we have some examples that go over the different formats and what feature types and features are for those formats. If you scroll down a bit in your manual, uh, we have some examples of Excel, CSV, Common Separated Value Files, and Esri Geo Database. For Excel, a data set is the XLS or XLSX file. The reader or writer uh, reads in that Excel data set or writes out that Excel data set. A feature type is a sheet, which is a single table within the workbook, and a feature is a row in that sheet. For the CSV file, we have the CSV file itself as the data set. The feature type would be that file. And then a feature is a row in that file. For Esri Geo Database, we have the .gdb file. That's the database. The feature types would be a single ArcGIS feature class or table within the Geo Database. And then a feature would be a single geometric feature plus its attributes. So you have points, lines, polygons, uh, or it could be a row in a table. So this brings us to the first exercise. So in this exercise, what we're going to be doing is opening up an existing workspace and then examining it and running it. So I am going to quickly go through this We begin in the lab, just uh, allow me to demonstrate first, and then once I've demonstrated, then you can go through it on your own. So in the lab, we can find the file. We can do that either by opening up the file browser here and going directly to it, or by opening up the actual file explorer in Windows and then navigating to where the source data is. The data is all being kept in C FME data 2020. All of the data that we use for this course is available in this folder. We have our workspaces. We have our course, which is intro to desktop. And then we can open up the exercise 1.1 begin. So that'll open up in the workbench. This time when it opens, it'll open up much faster than the first time you opened up workbench. See, very quick. So I'm gonna do a quick review of what this workspace is doing. Here in the navigator, I can see our readers we have two read, uh, sorry, three readers, 
and we have two writers. So we're reading in an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, the icon here indicates that it's within a zip file. And if we look at its location, we can see that it's actually a URL. This is a zip file being kept on a web, uh, web page, a website. So I run the translation, it's going to download that zip file. It's also going to read in two local files. I have a KML file, a Google Earth KML file, and a CSV file. Over here on the canvas, I can see that I have my KML file here. It contains uh, local planning areas. I have my CSV file, which has a summary table of uh, 311 data. And then I have my Excel spreadsheet, which is actually 12 files all being stored in that zip file, but they'll all be read in through here. And this contains 311 records from 12 separate locations. These connectors here show the flow of the data through the workspace. This blue box here, this is a transformer. Transformers do a specific task or action on the features. This one is going to test the features, removing features with missing values. I then have an attribute manager, which is going to clean up the attributes, a string replacer, which is going to find incons or sorry, fix inconsistent local area naming. This is going to replace bits of text string. The CSV file with the 311 uh, summary and the KML of the local areas, those are going to be joined together using a feature joiner. So this is going to take the attributes from the CSV file and attach them to the geometry from the Google Earth file. And then that'll all be written out to a KML file up here. And this data will be written out to a CSV file. To run the translation, we click on the Run button up on the toolbar. You can also find this Run button up here under Run, and you can run the workspace. So I can run the workspace here. It'll prompt me if I want to change the source or destination locations. Everything there should be fine, so I'm just going to run this. While that's running on the canvas, I can see the features being read in. And I can see how they're being processed through the workspace. So notice it's reading this one in first. That is the first reader listed in the navigator. Uh, features are read in in the order in which they're listed here. I can actually click and drag this up and down and change that order. So all of the Excel spreadsheet will be read in first. Once that is all read in, then it'll read in the KML file, this one here, and then it'll read in the CSV file. So we should see their feature count starting in just a moment. And when it's done, it'll tell you if there's any data that was not read. Uh, this is the unexpected input uh, warning when it all comes down to it. What it means is that the KML file actually has two additional layers within it, a document layer and a folder layer, but we weren't interested in those, so we don't have those defined on the canvas. So it wants to warn us about that. We're not going to care about it ever again. 
So I'm just going to click on the do not show this dialog again and hit OK. Now, if I wanted to inspect this data, I can inspect this data within FME, but KML, in order to really see what it looks like, it's best if you go to the actual KML file. I can get to the KML file here by opening up the containing folder. So what I do is I click on this feature type at the end here and click on the open uh, containing folder. Or if I wanted to, uh, over here, I can see where that destination is. It's all being written out to FME Data 2020 output training. Uh, so I could just navigate to that directly as well. So I have my FME Data 2020 output training. All of our output today will be going here. I can find that KML file. And if I double click on it, it'll open up in Google Earth. And then I can inspect what I was getting out of that or what that output is. So it opens up Google Earth. Not the most speedy thing at the moment, but there we are. So it's zoomed right in. I can see my polygons that came from the KML file. So each one of those areas has the 311 summary that was supplied by the CSV file. So it's combined the KML neighborhood polygons with the 311 summary data. So now it's time for you to try that. So I'm gonna give you guys five minutes to work through that exercise. Well, I'll check in in five minutes. Uh, if you happen to get stuck, remember you can click on the request uh, assistance or call for assistance button to get some help from a TA if you get stuck. If you're stuck for more than uh, 30 seconds to a minute, please request some assistance. I'll check in in five minutes. If we need some more time at that point, uh, we'll, we'll take a look at that. So that's five minutes uh, by the lab clock. It should be 8.40 right now. So at 8.45, I'll check in. Okay, let's continue. Uh, in the manual, you'll notice that there is a little quiz there. Uh, you can work through that quiz when you finish the next exercise, or you can come back to it after class and work through that quiz. So let's move on to translations. Many users start using FME because they want to convert data from one format to another. Data translation is the term we use at Safe Software to refer, to refer to the conversion of data from one format to another. We refer to translation rather than conversion to emphasize the goal of seamlessly letting data speak in the language of a different format. FME is designed to let you not just convert data from one format to another, but to create data to your exact specifications. In this section, we'll go over how to create a workspace to translate data. So people don't get lost, I'll send out the link to the current page. The Start tab displays different ways to create a new workspace, as well as access an existing workspace and resources. The quickest way to create your initial workspace is to click on the generate link on the start tab in the create workspace section. This will bring up the Generate Workspace dialog. 
This is a good way to quickly start a workspace with one reader and one writer. It's always possible to add additional readers and writers to the workspace later on. So here we have a little drop down, shows our most commonly used formats or the most recent formats used by yourself. But you can also just start typing in here. So if I wanted to read in say an Excel worksheet, I would just type in Excel. And it will suggest all the formats that have Excel in the name. So within the workspace or generate workspace dialog, you select your source and destination formats and data sets, the data set being the location of the data. Note that any red coloring in an FME dialog means that the fields are mandatory. Notice with the writer, the output data set is not mandatory. I can create this with a writer without actually defining the output data set location just yet. Once you've filled in the Generate Workspace dialog and hit OK, FME will read the source data set and present you with a list of, um, of the feature types. That allows you to choose which feature types you want to show on the canvas. This is really handy with some formats like AutoCAD. Uh, AutoCAD files often have a huge number of layers within the AutoCAD file, but you're not always interested in all of them. So you can pick and choose the ones that you want, and only those ones will end up going on your canvas. Remember, the feature types correspond to the tables or layers in your source data. That brings us to exercise 2.1. So in this exercise, we are going to generate a workspace using the Generate Workspace option. What we're going to be doing uh, throughout this course is building the workspace that we saw in exercise 1.1. So in the manual, there's a brief description of why we're doing this. So we have a job as a technical analyst. We're going to analyze some data that's brought in through the 311 call system. So the first thing that we're going to do is do a simple file format translation. We're going to read in the Excel spreadsheet. We're going to write it out as a CSV file. So in order to do that, let me quickly demonstrate. We have an Excel spreadsheet. The Excel spreadsheet uh, is available locally as well. I believe that might be the better way of doing it. Copy pasting into these machines is a little bit tricky. So if I go to FME yeah, 2020. Yeah, 2020. It's in either data or it's in the resources. I think it's there. There we go. So this will be the first problem that you run into when you go to do this with the local data. I've gone into my 311 folder. I don't see anything. And that's because the data is being kept in a zip file. And if we look down at the bottom here. This file selection dialog is trying to be helpful and only show us the Excel spreadsheets. So it's only showing us XLSX, XLSM, or XLS files, but actually have it in a zip file. So if I go to all files, now I can see my case locations. So make sure 
this is really important that you change this to allow all files. I can then choose my zip file, hit open, check the parameters. There's nothing in this case to, to check. That should be fine. Coordinate system, not going to worry about it right now. Actually, I will worry about the coordinate system. No, oh, no, I'm not. Okay. Uh, the writer is then going to be a CSV file. I just type in CSV. And I'm going to write that out to my FMedia 2020 output training folder. I'm not actually going to choose the output CSV file name. Uh, some of the formats are what we call folder-based formats. The output location is actually the folder, and then the feature type will actually be the file name. CSV files are one of the very few folder-based formats uh, that are out there. The other ones being Esri Shapefile and MapInfo Tab or MIPMID files, and some of the raster files. Check the parameters. That all looks okay. Coordinate system, don't need to worry about it. So I hit OK. And this creates my workspace. Now, the very first thing that you should do when you create your workspace is save your workspace. So as soon as you finish creating your workspace, go up, click on save. The default location is usually the My Documents FME folder, uh, but because I opened up a workspace from somewhere else, it remembers that location. So it's going to try to save it there. But I can always just go back up to Documents, FME, Workspaces. You don't have to do this. You can save it anywhere you like, as long as you remember where it is. The default File name will be the name of the reader to the name of the writer. That's not very descriptive. Uh, let's call this exercise 2.1. I can save my workspace. This is really handy because once I've saved my workspace, there's a recovery file. If something should happen, the power cord gets kicked out of my computer or you know, sometimes things crash, if I go back and open up this workspace, Workbench will see this recovery file and prompt me to recover any unsaved changes. That's why it's really important to save your workspace. I could then run the workspace. So you can see them all being read in and read out. I can expand these feature types to see the attributes which are available. Uh, there's also this bookmark that goes around it. We'll talk more about bookmarks later on in the course, but it's a way of organizing your workspace and it allows you to move objects on the canvas around very easily. Okay, so the translations run in the log window here. Always a good idea to check the log file. What we're looking for is this line here. Translation was successful with seven warnings. Warnings are things that aren't necessarily bad, but you should take a closer look at, and how many features I've written out. If the features written out is zero, chances are something's not right. With the warnings, that could be a bad thing. I can take a look at just the warnings by clicking on this button up here. My warnings, this is just telling me feature caching is on. Uh, feature caching is basically authoring mode. It allows me to inspect the features after a translation run. We'll see that in an upcoming exercise. And it's just telling me that it's gonna be slow because of that. It is slightly slower, but that performance hit is well worth it. And then just telling me about the feature caching. So all of my warnings are just feature caching warnings. That's fine, I could ignore those. Now to find my output, I can either go directly to where I saved it, or on my destination feature type here, when I click on it, 
I got this little icon bar up the top here. And this one right here is opening the containing folder. So when I click on that, I can now see the CSV file that I created, which is this one here. Okay. So that's that exercise. So now it's your turn to go through it. And again, I'm going to give you guys five minutes. Uh, my clock currently says that it is nine o'clock. Let's actually give you 10 minutes. Uh, so we'll, I'll check in again at 910. At 910. That way, when you finish it a little ahead of time, you can quickly go grab yourself a cup of coffee or do whatever you need to do. So I'll check back in at 910. Okay, welcome back everybody. So now we are going to move on to inspecting data. Just going to chat out the link to the web, uh, sorry, the manual. FME Desktop as a product consists of FME Workbench, where you build workflows, the product we've been using, and the FME Data Inspector, where you inspect the data that you're working with. You can also inspect data from within Workbench using what's called Visual Preview, the Visual Preview window. Visual Preview is basically a scaled down version of FME Data Inspector that lives within FME Workbench. In this course, we will primarily use Visual Preview, but we'll show you the Data Inspector in the next exercise. For me personally, ever since we brought in the Visual Preview window, I very rarely use the standalone FME Data Inspector application. I'm just going to go to my lab here. So when we run the translation with what's called feature caching turned on, and that is the default here, you can see the feature caching, that brings up these little caches for the output ports of everything on the canvas. So this is the canvas, this is a feature type, this is the output port of the feature type, and this little uh, spyglass here is a feature cache and from this I can click on this and it will open up that data in the visual preview. Now again you can see I'm getting fairly cramped here in my view so again I'm going to close my um, parameter window bring everything else over top of that. There's my visual preview and this gives me a view of my data. If I had geometry, I could also see the geometry of the data. I don't currently. So let's talk a little bit about this window pane here. You can also see this in the manual. So the automatic inspection button if this is on, whatever I select here, I will inspect. But you notice that I stop inspecting what I was looking at the moment I check something else. So the automatic inspection, it's the default. I find it personally a pain in the butt because I'll be looking at something here. Okay, I see something. I quickly want to go refer to something else, and now my view is gone. That's a pain. So I generally turn that off. It's not that hard to just click directly on one of these caches in order to inspect it. Okay, so the next up is the uh, display control window. So when I click on that, it will show me 
all of the objects which I could inspect. Later on, we'll have options where we have multiple caches. I could actually open up multiple caches and then be able to select which ones I actually want to view in here. So that's the display control. This is also really useful if I go to inspect a data set which I've created and it contains multiple feature types. So if I have an AutoCAD file, it has a lot of layers in it, I can select which layers I want to see by turning them on or off in here. The table view gives you a spreadsheet-like view of the data set, which includes all of the features and all of the attributes. You can change which table or feature type is displayed by using the drop-down menu. So if I have multiple tables available, I can choose which one I want here. And then it shows all of the user-defined attributes. The graphics view shows the geometry. And I can select the geometry. I can zoom in, zoom out. Uh, the usual navigation controls that you're used to in any sort of mapping application. This one here is the feature information window. Let me turn off the graphics view. When I select features in the table view, they'll also be selected in the graphics view or vice versa. If I select something in the graphics view, it'll be selected in the table view. Selecting that feature will also select it for the feature information uh, window. The feature information window gives us a lot more information. The table view just gives us our user-defined attributes. The feature information window will give us all of the attributes for this feature. That includes some additional attributes that FME creates when it reads in the data. We call those format attributes. We can see things like the FME feature type here. Uh, there's nothing too interesting with this particular uh, data set, but we get the row ID uh, for the Excel, uh, Excel spreadsheet. Uh, the cell type for that particular cell. Uh, but often that'll have additional information like uh, color information, things like that. And that can be found in the feature information window. The feature information window will also give you information about the geometry. And up here, uh, if the data is uh, has geometry, if there's coordinate system information, we can find the coordinate system information for this feature as well. And all of that is available in the information window. The final button is, it allows us to open this data set in the standalone data inspector application. So if I click on that, it'll open up the data inspector. This can be handy if I need a more permanent view of this data or if perhaps just working in the visual preview just isn't giving me enough screen real estate. By having it in this separate window, now I can see everything much larger. Okay, so in the manual, further down on the page, after the feature information window entry, there is a data inspector section. So in the data inspector section, it talks about how to open up the data inspector. Again, it's just like opening up FME desktop. I can scroll down from my desktop here so I can open it up on its own. There's just a little bit of lag while I'm clicking around here. I'm just going to learn to be patient with the virtual machines. The virtual machine, just keep in mind that this is located thousands of miles from where you're currently sitting. So there is just a little bit of lag. So we have the FME data inspector. I can open it directly there. The other option was to open it directly up within the visual preview. So 
just waiting to click over to my data inspector here. Right there. So in the data inspector, it's still the same basic setup, uh, except I have all the windows open. I don't open them up with that little sidebar of icons. Instead, it's opened up under the view here. So we have a table view, which is on. Um, this particular data set doesn't have geometry, so I'm not really seeing the geometry view, but I can turn that on here. So here I have my 2D view. We can also view data in 3D. So here's my geometry window, display control off to the side, feature information window over here, and the table view down here. There's also a log window that is not available in the visual preview, which will tell you what happened while well, FME was reading in this particular data set. Another option with this view here is that I can open up a data set. That'll open it up as a new tab. The tabs are completely separate, so I can open up uh, multiple data sets and then navigate around them all separately in these tabs. I can also add a data set to the existing tab uh, so I can compare data sets, uh, separate data sets. Just keep in mind that for the most part, you should have the same coordinate system with them or turn on a background map. And background maps, I'll talk about a little bit later. But first, let's go to the next exercise, exercise 2.2. Check out the link to that. In this exercise, you're just going to be doing some basic inspection. You'll open up the data inspector. You'll then open up the KML file that contains the boundaries. And play around with that a little bit. And what you will also do is add a background map. So maybe I will just demonstrate this really quick just to talk about some of the finer points of this. So in the lab, we're going to open up the data inspector. I can open up a data set uh, with a format here. Notice it says guess from data set. This is an opportunity for me to show you how this works. Uh, sometimes you can navigate directly to the data set. So I have my data set, data 2020. Data, it is in the boundaries folder. So we're going to be opening up these, this Vancouver Neighborhoods KML file. When I select the KML file, it can guess the format based on the extension here. Always double check that though. There's a lot of formats that have the exact same extension. Uh, MDB files, for example, there's like four or five different formats that use MDB. So always have it or always double check. Also, whenever you're going to read in a data set, get into the habit of checking the parameters. Most formats, the defaults will work just fine. But some of them, you'll really want to take a look at what you have available in the parameters. Because that will affect how the data set's being read in. For the coordinate system, if it says unknown or undefined, you may need to set the coordinate system manually, depending on your data set. But if it says read from source, that means that the data set is most likely coordinate system aware. And then it will read in the coordinate system from the data itself. That is important if you want to use a background map. Data can only be displayed with a background map if the coordinate system where the data is known. So if I select a feature here, in my feature information window here, I can see the coordinate system. This data is in LLA4. If you're not sure what that is, you'll notice that this is a link. I can click on that, and it will give me information about how this particular coordinate system is defined. Something useful here is the units. If you're not sure what units your data is in, check the coordinate system definition. This one is in decimal degrees. Now that I know that this data set is coordinate system aware, I can add a background map. We can find the background map setting here under 
add a background map. I can also just right click on this view. Oh, no, I can't do that in here. Okay, that works in the visual preview, but not, oh no, there it is, background map. Okay, so I can right click on background map. It's just lagging a little. And I can switch to a new background map or manage background maps. Because I don't have any background maps, switching to a new background map will allow me to add a background map. So this is what you'll be doing in the exercise. There are a number of background map uh, services available, but only one of them is free and doesn't require uh, an account, and that is the Stamin Maps. So I'm going to click on Stamin Maps. I'll name this one. I'm going to use the terrain one. Celebrate. Terrain. All of, of the map providers will have a little configuration section. What's in there varies depending on what they need. With the Stamina Maps, it just, just allows you to select which style of map you want. And they have three background maps available, terrain, toner, and watercolor. Watercolor looks really cool, but not as useful as terrain. So I'm going to go with terrain. I'll save that. And in a moment, this will bring up my background map. And there you go. Background maps are really helpful. Give your data some context. Okay, so now it's time for you to try that exercise. I'm going to give you guys, let's say, five minutes to play around with that. The current time is 9.30. So at 9.35, I'll check in. Okay, let's continue on to the next section here. Feature caching. Feature caching is something which I often refer to as authoring mode in Workbench. It is turned on by default, and I find it extremely useful. So under the Run menu, we have the option here to enable feature caching. There's also this option here, prompt for user parameters. You may have noticed that every time I go to run this workspace, I get prompted for my source and destination, or my input and output data sets. That's useful if I do want to change those things, but yeah, for this course, I don't. So. Something which is handy is being able to turn that off. So I'm going to turn off my prompt for user parameters. I still have my feature caching turned on. When feature caching is turned on, it allows me to inspect the data after I've run the translation at each output port. And that's indicated by this little magnifying glass icon. Keep in mind that this is a useful, useful method. Sorry, a useful method of workspace testing, but it does significantly slow down your workspace. Uh, it'll take about twice as long to run, perhaps longer, because it is caching a lot of extra data. Therefore, it should not be turned on if you're running this in production. Uh, if I'm running this workspace on my own desktop in a production environment, I want to run quickly. I've already done all my testing. I'll turn the feature caching off. However, while authoring, it is, it is significantly faster to use feature caching because then I don't have to run the entire workspace when I am doing a test run. Uh-oh. I've got some oddness going. Just uh, can someone tell me if you still hear me? Just one or two people type in yes. Can you still hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Because I've got some other weirdness happening. I just got logged out of something else here. 
This will just take me a moment to get back to it. Not sure what's going on with my network today. We've got other stuff refreshing. I wonder if it's just Chrome itself. Okay, that was a little odd. Just give me a moment to get back to where I was. Okay, Chrome was just acting really weird there. It closed a bunch of windows on me. Anyways, so back to where we were. Uh, feature caching visual preview. Uh, you can select uh, out any output port to inspect your data, but it's also really helpful for something called partial runs. So it's a good way of testing your workspace and isolating problems by only running part of it. So we can do this by disabling parts of it, or we can use partial runs. Uh, if you have the run with feature caching turned on, you'll have this option to run the workspace to or from any given point. So here, when I select a feature type, see I've got these two additional play buttons. It's just like the one up here. But this allows me to run to just this, so I can just run this part of the translation, or I can run from this and run the rest of the translation. Likewise, on my output here, I can run to this, so I can just run that part. Now that meant that I was actually reading it directly from this cache. That cache can take a long time to read in. And we saw that when we ran the exercise in exercise 1.1. Uh, we were downloading data from a web location, unzipping it, and then running the translation from there. And that took a fair bit of time. But once the data had been cached, I could run from that, and it would run from the cache, which is very, very fast. So when authoring your workspace and you're building it up, using these run buttons on the feature types or transformers can be much, much faster because you're not running the entire translation every time. You're just running part of it. Something to note here, if you're not sure what part of the translation it's going to run, as I hover over these buttons here, the part that's going to run will be highlighted in green. So if I just run to this, you notice that it's just this part, which is green. If I run from this, it highlights the rest of the workspace. So now it's time for you to give that a shot yourself in exercise 2.3. Check this out to everyone. So in this exercise, you're going to enable the feature caching and use those run to this and run from this. Also in the visual preview in the table view, something which I hadn't pointed out before is that you can sort the data by, uh, by the attributes. So by columns in the visual preview, you can sort your data. So I'm going to give you guys eight minutes to work through exercise 2.3. And the current time is 9.43-ish. So I'm going to give you guys until 9.52. So I'll check in at 9.52. Okay. Welcome back. Now we're going to take a look at schema and data model. The schema is the formal definition of a data set's structure. The schema consists of the layer names, attribute names, attribute types, allowed geometries, and any other rules or settings that define or restrict the data. When you first create a Workbench workspace, FME will add the source schema to the left-hand side of the canvas, as we see in the lab here, and then creates, as best it can, an output schema or output feature type. In the manual, there's a schema representation that has parks, transit stations, and libraries on the left, and then the writer feature type definition also has a parks, transit stations, and libraries as well.
You can open the properties of the reader feature types to see more detail of the schema. You can do that either by clicking on this little uh, gear icon. If your aim's not that good, you don't play enough first person shooters, you can always just double click on the feature type itself. And that'll bring up the feature types dialog. In the feature types dialog here, I can see the name of this feature type, the reader that it belongs to, its allowed geometries. There's sometimes some additional settings here as well that can limit the amount of data which I'm reading in. Uh, here I could indicate perhaps a start and ending row. With some database formats, there would also be a where or select clause available here as well. I can also see all of the user-defined attributes. So here's all the attributes. If there were attributes here that I was not interested in, I did not want or use during my translation, I could reduce the volume of data being read in by unexposing them. With this particular format, uh, any of the database-like formats, you can tell it to only read in the exposed attributes. With data with formats that are not database-like, uh, then I'm just hiding the attributes. It doesn't actually affect what's being read here. So you have to look for this attributes to read uh, header. Not all the formats have this. I can also see the format attributes. They are not exposed by default, but they are there. We can also view the writer schema in the same manner. I can double click on the writer schema. You'll notice that this is actually slightly different than the reader schema. There's some additional options, but also things like the name of the feature type are not grayed out. I can actually edit these. So in order to transform the schema of the data, you must edit the destination schema. That's simply the act of editing, for example, the attribute names, the attribute types, or the name of the feature type itself. We can also change what geometries are allowed if the feature type uh, makes that necessary. So with some formats, you're only allowed a single geometry type per feature type. Uh, there's not many formats that are like that, but it is some of the most commonly used formats. Uh, all the Esri formats are like that. Esri shape files, you have to choose what geometry you want to have in that feature type. Same with GeoDatabase as well. But other formats, you could have a mix of any geometry that is supported by that format. Once you've edited the schema, or created a new feature type, it may be necessary to connect or map the old schema to the new schema. If I have a situation like this where I don't have that connector going across, it's very easy to add that connector. I just hover over the output port or the input port, and I can click and drag a line between those ports. When I get close, it'll snap to it and then I can let go. Now, if you're working on virtual machines, sometimes they're a little bit laggy, so doing that click and drag, that can be um, a, a little troublesome because you know, like you'll be moving it along and it just won't be keeping up. In those situations, it's easier just to click. So here I can see that that port is selected. It's got that little blue halo. Now I can move over to another port, and when I click again, it'll connect it. Just gonna quickly check the manual there, see if I've missed anything. Nope. So that brings us to exercise 2.4. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of extra time with this particular exercise because we are at the top of the hour again. So let's give you a little under 15 minutes on this one. See if there's anything which I need to demonstrate in this. Uh, 
This one does have us adding a transformer for the first time. We're going to be adding in a transformer called the Attribute Manager. You are continuing with your existing workspace. So in the lab here, what you'll want to do is drop in an Attribute Manager. Now to drop in a transformer, what we do is we click on the connector we want to connect it to. So I'm going to click on this connector, it highlights blue, and then I just start typing in the name. The Attribute Manager is one of the most commonly used transformers in FME. The most commonly used transformers are the Tester and the Attribute Manager. The Attribute Manager is just using to, or being used to manage your attributes. To add it, I'm just going to type in Manager, or Mana. As soon as I start typing, this little quick add dialog will appear. I can use this quick add to add transformers. I can also use it to add readers and writers as well. This is actually how I mostly add things to my workspace. It will do a partial name search, so I don't have to start with attribute. The thing is, if you start typing in attribute, there are a lot of transformers with attribute in the name. So it won't really start narrowing it down to what I want until I put in the M for manager. So you might as well just start with manager. There's my attribute manager. I hit enter and it drops it in. At that point, it's already selected. I could double click on it to go into the parameters of the attribute manager, but because it's selected, I can just hit enter again. So when I'm adding the attribute manager, type in manager, select it, hit enter, hit enter again to go into the parameters and then I can make any changes which are necessary. Okay, so that's exercise 2.9. I'll check in at, uh, let's, let's say 1016 actually. That should give you enough time to finish the exercise and take a short coffee break. Good luck. Okay, welcome back everybody. Let's move on to transformations. In the previous section, we looked at data translation, going from format A to format B, and data inspection, which ultimately is just looking at your data. In this section, we're gonna look at what data transformation means, the two basic types of data transformation, and how it is handled in Workbench. So what is data transformation? Data transformation involves changing the structure, geometry, and attributes of your data, taking what you have and changing it to what you need. Data transformation can alter the structure or content of the data, or both the structure and content of the data together. Transforming the structure of the data could be called reorganization, this process includes the ability to merge data, as what we see here in the slide, A and B being merged together. Uh, we could also divide data, we could reorder data, define custom data structures. Transforming the structure of the data is carried out by manipulating its schema. Transforming the content of the data could be called revision. Manipulating a feature's geometry or calculating new attribute values is the best example of how FME can transform content. Now transforming the content of the data is mostly done using what are called transformers. Transformers are similar in concept to the tools in Arc Toolbox. Each transformer does a specific geometric or attribute transformation or some other support function. Transformers typically have a number of parameters that should be set. As we saw in the lab here, you can open up the properties window by, or the parameters window by clicking on this parameters button or just double click on the transformer. Or if you just added it and it's selected, if you just hit enter, that will also open up the parameters window.
Now the properties button is color coded. Uh, let me drop in two other transformers here. I'll put that one in and a, just trying to think of the ones which will have the colors that I want. So here we can see the three different colors. We have blue, yellow, and red. Usually when you drop in a transformer, it will be yellow or red. The yellow means that you have not opened up this transformer and set some parameters, but there are default settings, in this case the, uh, the output attribute name, which will work. So you can run the translation with transformers that have a yellow properties button. There are default values, they'll work just fine. When I go in and confirm that those are the parameters that I want, it will then turn blue. The red means that there are parameters which must be set because they don't have a default value that will work. You have to set the transformers with the red parameters button before you'll be able to run the translation or at the very least before you'll be able to run any features through that particular transformer. By that, I mean, if you have a workspace that looks like this, I could still run to this because that's not putting anything down this connector into this transformer. This translation will work just fine. I could even run from this and run the rest of the translation, but I would not be able to run the translation entirely. For example, I could not run from this on this feature type here. See, that highlights this in green. Features will go to that. When they get there, the translation will fail with an error message. So watch out for the transformers, which have red uh, properties button. That usually means that you have to set something. Uh, the yellow, it's worth reviewing just to make sure that the default values are what you think they are. Some transformers have multiple input ports, some have multiple output ports. The ports are usually named for what features are expected to either go into them or come out of them. Uh-oh, have I lost sound? Can anyone hear me? Okay, I've got one person with sound. Okay. So that has the try refreshing, or, oh, Sam already got to it. Okay, so uh, the transfer reports, usually named about what's going into them or coming out of them. Uh, the transformer attributes. Uh, here's an example of the ports. I have an input port here. I have the summary features and the complete coming out. Now, if you're not sure, what those ports mean. This is where I find the help dialog really helpful. Okay, just a little lagging here, a little bit of patience. Sometimes the machines have a little bit of an issue. I'm just gonna navigate away, come back. Yeah, the mouse isn't moving. That's the problem. I'm just gonna refresh my browser tab, see if that fixes it. I'll be back in just a moment. Okay, looks like I had a little bit of a problem with my machine. So it'll pop back in just a minute. Sometimes they disconnect. Um, so I'll talk more about the, uh, the attribute list later on. Just like the feature types, if you click on a little triangle, it'll list the attributes which are available. And that is in the manual. Uh, towards the end there, it shows that you can expand the list. That's a good way of seeing what attributes are actually mapped to the output, which ones aren't, but also which attributes are continuing through that transformer. Some transformers remove attributes and some transformers add attributes. So you can see what attributes have been added to that transformer. 
Okay, so that brings us to exercise 3.1. Let's just see if my lab's back yet. Not yet. So in this exercise, you're going to add some additional transformers and set the parameters in that transformer. I'm just going to do a quick review of what's in this, see if there's anything special. Not really. This does add the transformer in a different way. Now you can click on a feature connector to drop in a transformer in that feature connector. Still prepping. Another option is to just drop the transformer onto the canvas and then you can click and drag the transformer. There's a little dot that'll appear in the top left. You click and drag that over the connector, let go and it'll drop in. Okay. So let me give you guys eight minutes to work through exercise 3.1. My lab should be back by that point. So I'll check in at, uh, let's say, 10, 33. And we'll see if you guys are done at 10, 33. Good luck. Okay, let's continue on. I should mention, and I never pointed this out, uh, with most of these exercises, if you weren't able to quite get the previous exercise done, there is a start workspace that you can begin with. So for example, for the next exercise, when we get there, you can start with the exercise 3.2 begin. Oh, we've got... Issues of sound. Can everyone else hear me? Okay, good. I've got some people hearing me. Okay, so let's move on to locating transformers. So there's a couple of ways that you can find transformers. When I first started using FME, I used the transformer gallery myself. Um, the way which I actually learned how to use the product is I just went to the all here, opened it up, and started you know, clicking on transformers. Uh, this is really helpful if you go to the view help. So I can open up the help window. There we go. I'll drag that off to the side here. Eventually, they'll get in there. So all I really did was go through the Transformer Gallery and click on each one, and, well, read through each one. Uh, the names are fairly descriptive. So if you read through the names of all the Transformers, you'll have a pretty good grasp of what FME can do. If anything really gr uh, jumps out at you, oh, hey, I work with grids, you can click on that. Uh, again, if I could just get the help to be... Off to the side here. Can I get it over top of the feature information window? Nope. Okay. Um, so if you have two side by side windows, I'm not going to play around with that anymore here. As you go through the names of transformers, you can click on the ones that jump out at you. Now, that being said, um, you know, for me, it was important to know all the transformers. For you, that's not the case. We do have categories of transformers. If you never work with 3D data, if you never work with point clouds or rasters, there's a number of transformers that you can skip over. You don't have to review all 73 raster transformers if you never work with rasters. So you can just go through the various categories and review the transformers that might apply to you. Once you are familiar with the transformers, you'll generally find them through the quick add instead because you'll have a general idea of what the name is. So I need to you know, calculate something. If I type in calc, I can see all the various calculator transformers. And if I click on one of these, I'll still get to see not as much help as the help dialog shows, but a brief description of this particular transformer. And that's really useful. So I'll often use the quick add for that. 
Now the quick add is really good if you know the name of the transformer. Um, so I need to do something with areas. Not a whole lot of transformers with area in it. Maybe the one which I want isn't there. Typing in area only searches through the names of the transformers. If I want to search the description, the help as well, I can do that either by clicking on this little down thing and searching the help or just hit the tab key. When I hit tab, now it will search through the descriptions as well. So that casts a wider net. So that's sometimes helpful. Eventually, you'll probably be like me and you'll only use the quick ad for finding the various transformers. Another useful location is the FME hub. Uh, this is shown in the manual towards the end of the page there. Uh, the hub is really useful for a couple types of transformers. One is custom transformers. Custom transformers are collections of transformers that people have assembled together to create a custom transformer. It does a fairly specific task. Uh, so there's various, let's say, labels. I'll add in a label. I have the normal labeling transformers, and then there's some sort of like fringe case special situation transformers, like the adaptive labeler. This is a custom transformer. It has a lot of transformers in it, uh, you know, and you can open that up and take a look at it if you want. The hub is also useful for things uh, like this. These are packages. The package transformers are used when it's something that might be changing on a regular basis. Uh, for example, the S3 connector. This connects to an Amazon AWS S3 bucket. The thing is, is that Amazon might change how this is authorized, how it's worked with. They might add functionality throughout the year. Now, if you have to wait for the next release of FME, uh, there could be a bit of a gap in functionality there. So some of these transformers we offer as these packages, which means that we can update this particular transformer without requiring you installing a new version of FME. And those are also found on the hub. So that brings us to exercise 3.2. I'm going to chat out the link to that. So this is a five minute exercise. I'm just gonna quickly take a look at this to see if there's anything fancy. Uh, this does take you to our uh, Transformer Gallery on our website. I should mention that. So another way that you can review the Transformers outside of Workbench is to use uh, our Transformer Gallery on our website, which is www.safe.com slash transformers. And I'll chat that out as well. Now, what I like about this list, and it does something which the other lists don't do, if my browser will actually move, you can sort by rank. So basically, you can review the transformers in order of popularity, which, if you are short on time, might be the best way to do it because the transformers that other people are using a lot are probably the transformers you'll have to use a lot. So you can take a look at them by rank, and you can only do that on the website. It's not moving very quickly for me right now, so I'm not going to spend any more time there. Please take a look at, or please work through exercise 3.2. Two. I'm going to give you guys five minutes to work on this. It is currently 10.44, so I'll check back in at 10.50. Good luck. So the next uh, section of the manual talks about common transformations. And there's a list there of the top 30 transformers. Again, like on our website, you can sort by rank. Uh, if you're looking for a good introduction to what FME is capable of, uh, these 30 transformers, just reviewing the names and perhaps the uh, the help entry as well, if what it, uh, what it has for name jumps out at you, is a good place to start. One thing I will mention here is that you will notice some overlap in functionality 
in some of these transformers. For example, we have the attribute creator, the attribute manager, the attribute keeper, attribute renamer, attribute remover. All of these uh, have similar functionality. In fact, the attribute manager can do everything that the attribute creator, attribute keeper, attribute renamer, attribute remover can do. Um, it's just that sometimes you want a more focused transformer. Uh, the attribute manager will list all of the attributes that are on a feature every time you go to use it. So sometimes there's a bit of extra clutter in the interface because of that. So there are situations where you'd want to explore those other transformers. But generally speaking, if you're not sure where to start and you're working with attributes, start with the attribute manager. If you are filtering data, the most common transformer, the most commonly used transformer is the tester. Again, there's some overlapping capability between the tester, the test filter, even things like the attribute filter, but the tester is a good place to start. And then if you need additional functionality, you can investigate some of the other transformers. And so that brings us to exercise 3.3a. I'll chat this one out to you. I just want to do a quick review to see if there's anything special with this. No. So this is basically just a bit of a uh, treasure hunt for Transformers. So I'll give you guys five minutes, and I will check in again at 10.58. Good luck. Okay, welcome back everyone. Let's move on to workflows. And be sure to click on follow presenter. In the previous sections, we covered data translation and transformation. We were mostly working with relatively straightforward workflows. However, as you use FME more, you will run into more complex workflows. For example, reading and writing multiple formats with multiple transformations along the way. In this section, we'll look at how to approach workspace design so that you can create an effective and efficient workflow. It is unlikely that the transformation that you want to accomplish can be done with a single transformer. You will have to chain together a number of transformers to obtain the desired result. Sometimes it's necessary to create duplicate copies of your features to do transformations on. In that case, you are using transformers in parallel. A copy of all features will go along each separate feature connector that comes out of a port. If I go to my workspace here. Let's say I have my attribute manager here, and I also have this connector going into my area calculator. When I run this, a copy of all features will go along this connector, and a copy of all features will go along this connector. And that's what we mean by having a translation done in parallel. What's happening here is happening in parallel with what's happening down here. So we can split one stream into several, or we can also combine several streams of data into one. So I can go the other way, too. I can connect this back up into this port here. If you bring multiple feature connectors into a single input port, all features will go into that transformer or that feature type. So if you split your data into two 10 feature streams, or in this case, 97,000 feature streams, transform them separately and then bring them back together, you would have, if it was 10 in each stream, you'd have 20 going in. Or in this case, we'd have close to 200,000. If you want to combine or merge or join your features together. Uh, like we saw in the very first exercise, we had the geometry in one stream, and then we had the attributes in another stream. And I want to take these attributes and attach them to this geometry. In that case, we are uh, going to have to use specific transformers for that, such as the feature merger, feature joiner. If we want to do it spatially, it would be one of the overlayers, like a point on area overlayer or even a clipper transformer.
You can add more readers and writers to your workspace. That can be done up here through either the readers or the writers menu option. There's an add reader and add writer option. Or my preferred way is to just do it using the quick add directly on the canvas. For example, if I wanted to write out to a CSV file or read in another CSV file, I type in CSV and it lists my CSV reader or my CSV writer. And then I can just directly add them that way using the quick add. You can remove readers and writers also through the menu up here, readers and writers menu, or you can find that particular reader or writer in the navigator window. If I right click on something in the navigator, I can delete that reader or writer directly in the navigator. You can also add or remove feature types after reading a, adding a reader or a writer. Remember that the feature types belong to a specific reader or writer. And that brings us to exercise 4.1. Now it's time for you to try adding readers and writers. So you'll be doing this through the reader menu and the writer menu uh, at the top of the workspace. If you want, you can also try using the quick add instead. Okay, I'm just seeing if there's any gotchas here. Nope, oh, looks fairly straightforward. So I'm going to give you guys, uh, let's say 10 minutes actually to work through this. So it's 11.20 right now. We'll start up again uh, or we'll continue uh, at 11.30. Okay, so have at it. Good luck. Okay, welcome back everybody. So on to the next section, best practices. We're not gonna talk about best practices for very long, but this is actually one of the most important things to be aware of when using FME, specifically when using FME Workbench, and that is best practice. Best practice means the best way of doing something. Keep in mind that it's not the same for everyone. What's best practice for me might not be best practice for you. For me, the reason to use best practice is to make life easier for the people that will inherit my workspace. And sometimes that has ended up being myself several years after authoring the workspace. Uh, the main takeaway from this is uh, something to always be in the back of your mind is be kind to future you eventually you'll have to come back and maintain a workspace. And that might be years after you've originally come up with the logic behind your workspace. And years from now, the logic might not be as readily apparent as it was at the time, especially if you have kids, a year of no sleep, that's some serious brain damage. So uh, make sure you annotate everything really well. In my opinion, the most important thing you can do to improve the clarity of your workspace is to use annotation, otherwise known as comments. Now, for some transformers like the attribute manager, I mean, the logic behind this is fairly straightforward. I am managing some attributes, I'm mapping stuff. You don't have to add annotation to absolutely everything, uh, but if you're doing anything special in here, anything fancy, might be worthwhile. Where this is more important is if you have something like a tester. The tester is the most commonly used filtering transformer. The problem with the tester is that when I look at this on the canvas, I can't tell what this is doing. I don't know what the purpose of this is. I don't know what's past, what past means, what features are being passed, what features are being failed. So some straightforward uh, best practices. The first thing, maybe rename the transformer. And by rename, I don't mean changing the name of the transformer here. Knowing this is a tester transformer, that is really important information. Anyone inheriting this workspace, knowing this is a tester, that's good to know. Missing some attribute. Knowing 
why things are passing or failing or not missing some attribute, indicating what this transformer is doing is a good idea. You can do that in the name, but as you can see, the name can get long really quickly. So when I was talking about the process of adding a transformer, the first thing that I was doing to add the transformer, select the feature connector, drop in the transformer, hit enter, configure everything the way I need it, hit OK again, the transformer is still selected. At this point, it's a good idea to add some annotation or a comment. And you can do that by hitting Control K. So Control K for comment. Oh, wait. Because I'm on a Mac, things are often a little bit different. There we are. Control K for comment. By default, the value of the comment will be the name of the transformer or the feature type that you happen to have. Filter out uh, something. Indicating what the transformer is doing is okay, but the most important part is the because. Why, why are we doing this? What is the rationale behind this particular step? And years from now, it's that rationale which will be the important thing to know and being able to know that at a glance. So while you're authoring your workspace, keep in mind that people should be able to understand what's happening at a glance. So the first step with best practice, adding these comments or annotation. So that's the annotation. Uh, there's another type of annotation, actually, which can also be helpful, called summary annotation. You can add summary annotation to uh, transformers. You can also add it to uh, the feature types as well. What's nice about the summary annotation is that it is automatically configured. It reflects what is what the parameters are within a transformer or a feature type. So if you want to be able to just see what the parameter values are in a particular transformer or a feature type, the summary annotation is really helpful for that. The downside of the summary annotation is that sometimes it just gives you more information than you want. In those situations, I can right click on this and I can convert this to a normal annotation. If I do that, it won't be automatically updated anymore, but it allows me to come in. Uh, most of this is already filled out and I can delete what I don't need. So that's the summary annotation. That can also be really handy on things like trans, uh, like the tester transformer. I can show my summary annotation here so I can see exactly what's being tested. Now these annotations can only be attached or point to a single object on the canvas. This annotation can be attached to this transformer. It can't be attached to other transformers at the same time. Sometimes you want to talk about a collection of transformers or feature types, kind of a block comment. And that is where bookmarks come in handy. You'll notice that we already have some bookmarks here. These bookmarks were added automatically when we generated this workspace. You can resize the bookmarks. I can move them around. When I move the bookmark, everything inside the bookmark moves with it. So this is actually also a really good way to keep your workspace organized. If you put bookmarks around related transformers or feature types as you are authoring the workspace, it makes it very easy to create additional space on your canvas for other parts of your translation. If I click on the parameters for the bookmark, it allows me to change the name of the bookmark and also change the color of the bookmark. So I can color code my workspace. A final spot where the bookmarks really come in handy is in the navigator. The navigator is used to set parameters, things like my source data set location, my destination data set location, the coordinate system, also a number of parameters which will affect how readers and writers work. I can also find all of my transformers here as well and review their parameters and edit them if necessary. But where the navigator really comes in handy is with large workspaces, because anytime I click on something in the navigator, it will snap to focus 
in the canvas, so it makes it easy to find particular parts of my workspace. To make that even easier, the bookmarks are listed here, so I can find particular areas of my workspace, and I can find whatever is within those bookmarks as well. Another reason to rename or append a descriptive name to your transformers is that you can then also search the navigator for those particular objects. Okay, I just want to see if there's anything else. Uh, oh, I never told you how to add a bookmark. Okay, there's a number of ways that you can add a bookmark. You can find it up in the menu bar, but the best way to add a bookmark, in my opinion, is to select the objects that you want the bookmark around. I can either click and drag a fence, or I can just hold down control and click on what I want. And then you hit control B for bookmark and it'll place a bookmark around them. I can then name the bookmark, I can change its color, things like that. One final thing, let's see. Just wanna talk a little bit more about feature caching before we run out of time, because we've only got a few minutes left here. I'm gonna set, actually, no, wait, I don't even have to do that. So I'm gonna to run to my attribute manager here because this is a little piece of functionality which I don't know if we actually mentioned anywhere. So I'm just going to run into my attribute manager. I'm assuming that's actually running somewhere. There we go. Can I turn off my feature caching? I hope not. Yeah, it might not show up. My computer's acting a little slow at the moment. With the caches, when you go to inspect them, you might have caches in two separate ports that you want to be able to look at. If you hold down the control key and select those caches, you can actually bring in both caches. And you'll see them both listed when you go to the display control. If I get a chance to show that later on, I will. But for now, let's get you working on the next exercise, practicing. Uh, you can work through 4.2a and 4.2b. And I will give you guys 10 minutes in total to work through those two. That should be five minutes for each one, five minutes, five minutes. So work through 4.2a and 4.2b. And I'll check back again in 10 minutes minutes. Okay, welcome back everyone. This brings us to the wrap up. We let's see. I want to talk a little bit about the certificate of completion. The certificate of completion is the link will be made available to you once you fill out our course feedback form. Yes, we require you to do a little bit of homework before, well, not homework. You have to give us a little bit of feedback before we give you your uh, certificate. So please follow the link that I just chatted out. It'll take you to the survey. Once you have completed the survey, if this will let me go down to the bottom here. So please take, uh, let's say two minutes right now to go through the survey. Once you have completed the survey and hit done, uh, take special note or 
uh, write down this URL somewhere. It's the only time you're really going to see it because once you log into the quiz, uh, the the URL kind of disappears. Uh, once you hit done, it'll take you to the quiz. So please take take two minutes to fill out the feedback form, and it will take you to the quiz. Uh, just some final things before I let you go for the day. Uh, we do have a number of webinars coming up. I do recommend that you check out our webinars page there. Let's see if I can chat that out as well. Uh, we've got one tomorrow, uh, creating no-code web apps with FME Server. Uh, we also have a guide to working with spatial data at scale in the cloud coming up this month and then some interesting ones coming in September as well. Also be sure to check out our uh, community. The link for that is on the start tab in uh, FME desktop, or I can go to the community here. I'll chat this out as well. Community is an excellent place to find additional resources for FME. So that's it. I want to thank everyone for taking this module. I hope you found this useful today. Have a nice day, everyone, and goodbye. Uh, the machines will shut down in about five minutes. Have yourself a good day. Bye.